just because we make a hormone doesn't mean that we're actually using that hormone. And a lot of the medicine and the pills and the solutions are, well, just, you need more hormones. And yet you still have to break that hormone down. It still has to get in the cell. You still have to be able to use it. It's, it's, that's really, especially as a woman whose hormones have declined as I go through menopause, I realize, oh my God, I, I gotta, I'm gonna make sure I'm breaking every hormone I get down and it's getting into the cells. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Mindy in the house. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. The carnivore diet. Because of what we eat. Honestly, you've really touched my heart. So Fast Like a Girl, it's ready for pre-order now. I hope this book changes your life the way the information has changed hundreds of thousands of women that have applied it. From the bottom of my heart, enjoy and let's get healthy together. Here's what I wanna start with is, uh, you know, I love your Facebook post, by the way. You are the best at, in health, I think, as at, with your Facebook posts and now your graphics are incredible. So I definitely want to leave links for everybody to go check that out. And you had a post, gosh, I don't know how long ago, but this was the title of it or the beginning of it. And you're going to remember it, but it said, uh, men are more hormonal than women. Yeah. And honestly, the first time I saw that, I was like, oh, hell no, Dawn, they are not. So convince me as to why men are more hormonal than women. Yeah, well, that's always a shocker for people on both sides. Because women, yeah. you know, women, you know, they I think it comes down to cultural norms and, and issues like that we can talk about. But the bottom line is men have eight, at least eight different cycles within their testosterone life and world that can be going anytime. They have it daily, they have it monthly, they have it seasonally. They have it during different times of the year, uh, and they also have it uh, in situations. So th it, it changes the old saying, you know, if you don't like your man's answer, wait 15 minutes and ask him again, right? Does Same that work? thing. Yeah. So we're, we are so hormonally up and down all the time. It makes a woman's regular cycle look strange to us. But the reality is that's much more predictable, much more to some extent, right? Predictable and reliable than men's because men's are all over the place. You know, and it's it's an That's issue. Crazy. Okay, so and I understand that, but let's talk about like what does so testosterone for a woman, a woman, and testosterone for a man? Do they do different things in our bodies, even though it's we call it the same hormone? Yeah, it does. Some of the core fundamentals are the same. Uh, they okay. they drive focus, sex drive. Uh, libido, all of that kind of thing. That's, that's the same. We just get it in different percentages based on male, male or female, right. but that's the same. But men, it has a different effect. It affects much more of the brain chemistry than it does in women. So it, we oh. know about the body chemistry and how it makes right. us feel and get revved up, but the brain chemistry uh, as well. And so you see uh, it a lot with men at a subtle levels when there's problems, when you, you look at the a, type A personality or okay. the, the overachiever, and we kind of trophy Put them, put a trophy out there for those people that are go go go. Definitely. In reality, that's that's an imbalance potentially going on. In the irritable male syndrome, we it's identified as early to moderate onset of male depression uh, issue, and it just it all it all cycles together because culturally men don't get depressed, right? You know, <laughs> men don't. At first, they won't talk well, about it. Doctors won't listen. Theoretically. Well, I'm just talking the general culture is that, that that's a, even the even the medications and the treatments are all women centric for decades. I think right. it's a terrible in, imbalance going on, not to mention that all, most of the doctors that are doing it are men. Right. So there's right. a disconnect there. But um, yeah. So the, yeah, in men, the testosterone has a much deeper effect in the, the thinking and the mindset and the, and the way they focus, because we all know we're wired differently. And you can just think of the stress response when when stress hits, same stress, we've got a man and a woman, different reactions. Mm -hmm. Men get focused. They want they're looking at one thing. They're ready to do something right now. And it just like now, not three steps down the road, where it's immediate danger kind of kind of concept. Whereas mm -hmm. women, they kind of they broaden their, their focus. They expand out. They mm -hmm. bring in, they commune, yeah. right? That's their strength. And so okay. the, com the the differences is great. So the, the, the idea that we would approach and analyze or deal with stress or that kind of response the same 
across the board like we do like they have in medical books and stuff so like that is just re is ridiculous and then the, and what ends up happening is the brunt lands on the woman for that category that's why the right. diagnosed so much more identified and the man falls through the cracks until something really big hits so if if there's let's say you're you're in a house with a man your woman in a house with a man if they're if you're both trying to address a problem is the man's brain looking for the singular answer and the woman's brain wants to verbalize the problem is that where test i mean when you say we men you, the testosterone makes their brain very focused under challenges is what i heard and women it makes us very broad does that how does that show up in our behavior again you'll see it express more as soon as there's conflict like not just talking regular relationship stuff that's fine but as soon as something that's why money becomes such a big hot button because that just sets things off, right? The, what's the number one um, reason people fight in a marriage or a relationship is over money. And then you right. ask them, how often is money the issue you're arguing about? Right. Almost never, right? Because it just right. creates that. And so once you've kind of set off that certain level of the tipping point for upset, yeah, the man was like, because not only can you, you need to do something right now, right? Right. Because that's, that's, it makes them settle down, right? Otherwise they will spin. Men will spin like crazy. Right. And next thing you know, it's like, yes, that's the problem. And the problem in, in this house and that carpet, that carpet, it's messy. The dog, a dog. I didn't want the dog in the first place. And the kids and the, and the woman's like, what just happened? And the guy just, yeah. right? It's out of control. And that's because so, that just got set off and they didn't, have, they didn't get their outlet. And now all it has to do is one thing to do. And when, what I do with people, when, when guys are in that, I say, okay, let's make a plan to make a plan. Mm -hmm. that's all you got to do and they're like oh okay interesting right so so is this like a, a man hack is what i'm hearing that if my if i'm in conflict with my husband if i give him one thing to do to 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 resolve the conflict it'll calm his male brain down no that will aggravate him if you okay, listen so and just he'll say something he'll want to do and it might not have anything to do with you think relevant or whatever good do it let him do it okay because the idea of making a plan to to make a plan, it's a check off the list, and that instantly starts to downregulate that that spin, and calms okay. them down. Having that's why men, when when they're really confronted, like midlife crisis and, and things start to mount, they run, they escape, mm. They, mm. they they talk even less, they retreat into the man cave. Right? It's because that there's no there's there's nothing moving forward. There's no there's no outlet for that that hyper focus, and so the only thing that makes sense in that moment, which doesn't make sense is they run. Is they run. Forget it, forget it. Okay, and so that's how testosterone shows up. That's testosterone being the hormone that's affecting that. And yeah, that's, that's the main catalyst. Now to be at that point, you're already kind of, you're up there, right? You're already right, got yeah. stuff, the physiology, the insulin, everything is already kind of right. uh, sensitive. And so, yeah, right. But that's, that's what creates that. And, and you can't get out of that as a man it's really hard that, that's why they can't see it either right one of the symptoms right. which makes it very hard to deal with is the men don't see it and their common answer will be it's not me it's her right Clear today it's not me it's her and that's not just a defense that's what they think fascinating okay so then here's where my brain goes then it is it more instinctual in a as conflict gets deeper in a marriage for a man to run than for a woman based off our hormones if that that venue that that avenue doesn't get opened up yeah i mean that's right. it becomes the, the prefrontal cortex starts to shut down and the that's why also the same thing with addiction why men are more uh vulnerable to addiction it shuts down the prefrontal and it raises up the impulsivity part of the brain because because it wants that action do something something, something you know and right. then when there's nothing to do then they that's when for some reason it looks like a good idea to blow it off whatever it is yeah, fascinating. Okay, and then in the day, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot about as I've moved through menopause is that I started to like understand my own hormones for the first time, which I think is really fascinating that I had to understand my own hormones at like my late 40s. And I realized that my testosterone surges were coming va at vastly different times than my husband's. So men get testosterone surges every couple of hours in a day. Is that correct? Every 15 to 20 minutes, it'll shift. 15 to 20 minutes. 
So if they have normal testosterone levels, then do you think that there is a mismatch between a woman's testosterone surges and a male's testosterone surges? We're getting it like once a month. Men are getting it every 15 minutes. That, that alone creates conflict, I would think, in a marriage. Yeah. And, and again, those are just the, the fluxes throughout the day. So there's more in the morning, less in the afternoon, and then okay. and and more towards the end of the month and the beginning of the month for men. Right. And then there's more in October than spring, which I always confuse me, but that's the way it was. Really? Why? The fall is it goes up and then it comes down and is lowest in the spring, which I thought would be the opposite, but it's not. Yeah, because aren't we supposed to reproduce in the spring? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's right. You know, I figured, but Nope, that's not the way it is. But for men, when it comes down to it, it's not always the number. The number can really be misleading. It's the efficiency. It's, you know, it's the sex hormone binding globulin relationship with the free and with the number. So here's the deal. I'd rather someone have a low number with high efficiency than right. a high number with low efficiency, right? Right. That'll burn. That's burnout. That over time. That's that's right. going to be trouble. And I learned a lot of this when I was working with some, some athletes who were on steroids. And so we had to. How do you interpret numbers when they're on steroids? Is, is right. so we started looking at that and looking at how much they're actually using because they had huge numbers, but some of them still weren't using it very well at all, even though they were blasting it through them. And so we started to look at that and, and extrapolate out. So it's about efficiency. And what drives the efficiency is your, met, your neuro, neuroendocrine state, your metabolic state, mm. uh, whether you're in a fed state or you're in a repair state. Are you got insulin driven or, or, or human growth hormone? Yeah, I think that on all hormones is the most interesting discussion because just because we make a hormone doesn't mean that we're actually using that hormone. And a lot of the medicine and the pills and the solutions are, well, just, you need more hormones. Mm -hmm. And yet you still have to break that hormone down. It still has to get in the cell. You still have to be able to use it. Is, is, that's really, especially as a woman whose hormones have declined as I go through menopause, I realize, oh my God, I, I gotta, I'm gonna make sure I'm breaking every hormone I get down and it's getting into the cells. And what I hear you saying is if a man goes and gets his testosterone checked, doesn't matter necessarily the level. It's only one part of the equation. It's how efficient he is at using it. Yeah, because when, when you do the intake form and you do some personality or some lifestyle questions, they don't match up. You know, it's not it's not linear like you would see in a book. High, low. We're not chemistry sets. We're not a pool, right? You know, if it's green, do this and this tinker. It, it never works out well when we when you try to even whether you do it medically or even naturally. It just yeah, so I've always had an issue with that. It's just not linear, but when you understand what could be holding back that expression, because I tell people hormones whisper, they don't scream. Mm. When we just throw more hormone on there, we're just screaming and so the body true. just, you know, they're so powerful. 90 over 99% of a hormone will be bound when it's released because it's so, it's so powerful. You know, hormones are just, they're, they're amazing oh, and yeah. what they can, can do and they can shift the body faster than the nerve impulse yeah. and, and so forth. So, you know, they're bound. And so, okay, how much is bound? How much is being utilized? And then the, the other key to hormones is the recycling process. If you don't have a good recycling repair process, it's, you're not going to be feeding into the quality system, so to speak. Right. If, you, if you think about it, if you're using all disposable food wrapper, one item things, you're creating waste, you're creating, it's not efficient, it's expensive. Same thing. If you're not recycling, your, your body's not recycling things like hormones or proteins or minerals, then it's expensive. A lot of cook builds up and it gets in everywhere and it can cause a lot of problems. Wow. So, okay. So let's start with this. How would, if somebody's listening to this, how would they know they have low testosterone? What are those classic signs other than depression? You mentioned that. Well, yeah. And that does motivation is a big one because when you're in that fed state all the time, you start, things start to change, the chemistry starts to change and you'll notice things in the personality. Uh, sometimes the men notice it right away. Sometimes not more okay. often, not, not until later, but things like motivation and decision-making suddenly a decisive man will be indecisive and they'll mm -hmm. feel weird about that. They don't, they know something's wrong, but that's just, that's just not me. They'll be right. indecisive. Procrastination will suddenly procrastination is a symptom in my opinion, and, and, and not a personality flaw. Right. Right? People aren't procrastinating, they express procrastination right. and that'll start to go up. And so you'll see a lot of the driver elements start to soften and 
that might not be a bad thing, but it, it'll get to a point where some, you're just like, that doesn't sound like you kind of thing. Okay. And, and he'll feel that too. Like, you know, I, I don't feel like myself. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Irritable Male Syndrome book, where this whole concept started from, he talks about the loss of the male identity. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of that's cultural, a lot of that's societal uh, and stereotyping and all, all that kind of stuff. But that's where it comes from. And you just see this, they start to change that way. You know, that's how you can, that's one way. Obvious ways are energy drops, muscle tone shifts. Um, and that has a lot to do with the relationship with human growth hormone, which controls the expression of testosterone physically. Okay. And so, and human growth hormones inversely related with insulin. Back to everything you wrote. And we're reading the book and- I know, that's uh, awesome. And yeah, it's fantastic. It's right on. And, and, and so it all, it all ties back. And so yeah. if the guy's got insulin resistance, you know, sex hormones are going to be a problem, just like with women, just you know, like it's women. downstream, yeah. you know, yeah. insulin is the bully on the playground and messes with everybody. <laughs> well said, well said. So, okay. So now if I want to rate, if I want to keep my testosterone up, I'm a man, I want to keep my testosterone up, or I want to raise my testosterone up. What strategies do we have? You have to kind of go upstream and rather than trying to raise it, you want to increase the efficiency first because that, okay. that's a negative feedback loop. And so to do that, you got to drop insulin resistance. Then things like vitamin D will start to come up and okay. you see uh, HDL start to come up because that means DHEA is getting, is getting back in the scene because DHEA makes the estrogen and testosterone, okay. right? And so it'll start to come full circle. So the first things you can do is just clean up the diet. And the biggest thing about that, like, like in your book, it's not about always what is about when Yeah. a lot of people don't need to eat less. They need to eat less often. Yep. Right. And, and just doing that will start to make that shift because as soon as you eat something, a man eats something, their testosterone drops dramatically. And all yeah. it takes is like two to 300 calories, a snack, and they'll just cut their testosterone right there, which is, which is interesting because not many hormones, you can do that. So, okay. So now I'm thinking this through, like, if a man is already struggling or thinks he's struggling with testosterone and he has a standard American diet filled with like meal with bad oils and high sugar, high carbs, then for, I mean, we, we probably don't know how long, but maybe, you know, for what the next hour or so his testosterone is going to be lower than before he ate that meal. Is that correct? Yeah, I'd say probably more than an hour. Um, we know the immune system will get a hit and that takes four hours. So I would put it in the range of somewhere between two and four hours, two and four hours, which okay. you, if you eat meals and snacks that puts you right in the range of your next food. Right. And so you, you, right. Just, keep, you just keep, just keep basically going. holding it down, holding it down, holding it down. Okay. And what part does testosterone play in like erectile dysfunction? And I mean, we know it plays a part in libido, but with men gravitating towards medications like Viagra, um, is it possible that just what they eat and when they eat it before they try to have sex would, would affect their performance in bed? Not necessarily that day, but over time, the net effect would. And it doesn't take a lot of time because the way you eat is so tied into capillary function, blood mm -hmm. flow. So testosterone gets the arousal, arousal going and then the actual event and the erection and, and going forward, that's more systemic for cardiovascular. For, and and that, that's why diabetics lose that almost mm -hmm. all the time, or even pre-diabetes is such a big issue um, because of, of that. And so the same efforts will shift that as well. because You drop the insulin exposure, you drop the meal frequency, and pretty quickly you'll see a change in that. The first thing men will notice is uh, that they'll start to wake up with erections again. Uh, ah. and sometimes they don't even remember that they don't have them until they get them again. Like, oh, yeah, right. I remember that. And uh, they'll start to see that start to change. And they'll know, they'll know when they're on the right path. Okay. And are they, so it's a combination of cardiovascular plus the right hormonal balance. Those two things have to, and by hormones, I mean, insulin and testosterone, like you've got to have, and this is the hard thing about hormones. I mean, I try to, I mean, you are helping lots of people with fasting and, and you are the insulin resistance king and um, man, hormones are moving targets. Just when you get them like lined up, they like move. And it's really, this is why I think lifestyle is the only way for us to, to balance them because they are constantly moving. So do you think what I'm curious from your point of view, what do you think is the worst food that will contribute to insulin resistance? The worst food. That's a tough question. I would say for insulin in general would be a processed food, any food 
that is made with a powder becomes a super insulinogenic food. It's a super sugar, even more than table sugar. So we're talking about flours of any kind. So okay. breads and baked goods, because we take up food and we make it into a powder, then we use the powder to make something else. Right. The body doesn't sense food in the system for the majority of the insulin exposure. It, it interprets it. There's right. an interpretation. So it's in your gut before it's in your body, before it's in your blood, before it gets to the pancreas, you got 70% of your secretion of insulin already going because your body just interpreted that. So it, somehow it's interpreting soft foods, liquid foods, and denatured foods like flowers and protein powders and powdered stuff as a, I guess a threat. I don't know, but it, we know it has a, a hyper response. So that if you want to decrease your overall insulin exposure, you just shift away from anything that's fabricated, anything that's made from a powder, essentially. And it doesn't matter what kind people will say, hey, but I use almond flour. I use keto, I use keto based coconut flour. I'm like, it's still a powder. That's why you take 30 grams of protein powder, best okay. quality in the world, and 30 grams of the best steak in the world. They're both 30 grams of protein. The insulin response is dramatically different. Three times or more of with the powder than the the whole food. Just different different story. So you are you're not a protein powder user then? No yeah. ma'am, no not at all, not at all. I, I've had so many athletes that we had metabolic problems, and some of them even had diabetic crashes when they're off like in Hawaii on, a, on in a competition, and we were like, why? These are these are top level athletes, and they're and they're fit, and they they eat per perfectly they were using these protein powders and things like BCAAs, branched chain amino acids to help them pre-workouts, post-workout, all of that was just crushing their insulin profile. And that was it, you know, wow. that was it. And that was a tipping point for them. And so wow. you get them off that and then everything else kind of works better together. Wow. So are there foods that we can, that men can add in to improve testosterone levels? So we can take foods out, the powders I'm hearing is one, what are there foods we can add in to improve testosterone? Uh, the first step is the frequency that makes, they got to open that gate first. So, so we assume that's been done. And then whole foods are the first choice. Higher fat would be a great choice uh, for that. Cholesterol based foods are a good option. Such as cholesterol makes, eggs. yeah, eggs, butter, bacon, cholesterol, natural good cholesterol, because that's where our sex hormones are made from that those building blocks right. in our body. And so that's good. And then the other thing that's hard to convince the men, easy to convince the women is you got to take care of your skin. 50% mm -hmm. of men's testosterone is made in the skin. 75% of women's estrogen is made in the skin after menopause, hundred percent up to hundred percent made in the skin. This is a endocrine organ. Okay. And we, we underestimate that. And it's, it has a feedback loop with, the, with HPA and HPO uh, axis that, that you talk about in your book. And it's just, it's a major player. So there's a couple of things you can do with that. One is you got to be very careful what you put on it. Okay. Don't, like you, you, you talk about the, the hormonal disruptors and, 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 and so forth. The, you know, nothing, you don't put anything on it that you wouldn't eat. If you use, right. you use oils, make sure that the, you rotate them. So coconut oil is great, but if you use it every day, it'll strip stuff because it's, it's astringent, right? Okay. Same thing like oil pulling and, and so on. And then you want to flex and get metabolically fit in your sweat reflex. So you want to sweat. You want to learn to sweat. Yeah, people don't, people have lost that ability. It's a trained ability I've, I've found. And um, what? Yeah. People don't sweat. You don't sweat. How do you get your, what if you're listening to this and you're, you don't sweat? Well, how do you get yourself sweating? Well, you have to, again, it's, it's a muscle. So you're training it. And a okay. good way to do it is you can like, you can do the infrared sauna. Uh -huh. I, I love the infrared sauna. I use that, whether it's a personal box sauna or a full sauna to get that going. You can do temperature acclimation stuff where you get warm and cold, warm and cold. Right. Um, if you have access to a sauna, you do some kind of warm up in exercise, you know, car, whatever you want, and then get right into that sauna to like catapult that. And you'll notice you'll, you'll sweat more over time. In the beginning, you might not sweat much, but you'll sweat more over time. You'll notice the type of sweat that comes out and the, the odors and the different changes. It is, it's very, and your skin will change and your hair will change dramatically as you do it. The skin, the, the sweat 
process through the skin is the number one detox process in our body, even bigger than the, the liver, right. stronger than the liver. And it's natural. So we're not forcing it to do anything. We are just opening up the way for it to do what it wants to do. Right. We in a controlled environment. So we don't sweat. Our temperature stays pretty constant, right? Wow. Air conditioning, heating, car, this, sitting. We're, we're right, pretty yeah. mellow. We don't like, we, I, I think the greatest like hero that needs to come back into this world is the idea of hormetic stress, that we thrive under stress, but we have been living in a world that wants to keep us comfortable in all ways, shape or form. So, yeah. yeah well, that, the body thrives on variables. Yeah. I talk about the, the, the primal genetic adaptation pathways that, that create healing, fast healing and fast change. And that's the start, stop, start mechanisms. Anytime you get that variable in there, the body goes, I got to change right now. Something's going on right. It's like life or death in a good way. And it'll change versus a constant. It's kind of like, this is okay. I don't do it. Think of heart rate variability. The healthiest heart rate variability is a, is a, lot, of con, a lot of variable. You want a good variable in there. And the worst variability is a flat line. You're dead, right? right? Yep. It's just, it's, it's a good thing. And you want to work out and get in shape. If you do the same thing every day, the same way all the time, you don't, it's, it stops working for you. Same thing with diet, everything. We want the variable. I use functional fasting, but we have a, we do a fasting rotation. We rotate it, keep it going, put it on the calendar. Don't do the same thing. That's why people who get into intermittent fasting, they're all excited for a while. Yep. They start to balance out just like we learned from the low fat, low cow daily thing Yep. for decades. Yeah. Your, your body will adapt. What do you think about the studies that are on fasting about testosterone? So the two that I've seen are 1300% for men at, uh, you know, 15 hours. And then like, it goes up to like 2000% surge at like a 24 hour fast. It, you think that's accurate? Yeah, that, but that's happening in people who aren't trained and, and they're coming from a, a certain point, just like a, a new, a new lifestyle change to someone who's not doing something. Is a, it looks big, like it's a, right. it's a big shift. And like they say, this cereal helps lower cholesterol along with diet and exercise. Yeah, right. if you're eating pancakes and syrup over here, right, then that shift is good. But you, could you do better? Of course. You right. Know, and so on. So yeah, you get those surges. The, the key thing to watch though is the is the a human growth hormone response. Okay. Because yeah, the testosterone will peak up and down, but it's the growth hormone that'll really lock in the benefits from it. And that's, in, again, inversely related with insulin. So that those are good markers to watch. So as insulin goes down, human growth hormone goes up. As insulin goes down, human growth hormone can go up. Okay, what's, why do you say can? Because it's not a literal teeter-totter. Insulin holds things back. Right. Like if you have low vitamin D, even though you're in the sun or you're taking supplements forever, it's because insulin resistance is there. Now you, you lower that. Now those have a chance to go up. It doesn't mean they automatically will. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like you take vitamin D, it doesn't mean your insulin resistance comes down. You'll have some changes, but you have to do that work. Right. You don't do that work. Then whatever you're supplementing is, is not going to do that much. Yeah, for sure. So with testosterone, yeah, you, you get those swings, and but we also see two thousand percent increase in human growth hormone from a high intensity training, yeah. or from sauna work, or from the different. Th- there's a good numbers out there, as far as that goes. But the key is to do it over time. Right. You do it over time because it's all about efficiency. Right. Efficiency, efficiency, not the number. Because yeah. again, high number in someone who doesn't have the efficiency is just a waste. Yeah. I just saw a really interesting study, human study on um, 24 hour fasts. And they found that if people, and it was done on both men and women, that if they fast one time a month for 24 hours and they followed 2000 people over a course of four and a half years, they found at the end of four and a half years that they had, and they didn't really say I had to go buy the study to find out what the markers were, but they said all the markers for longevity and improved survival rate uh, improved just from one 24 hour fast a month. But it was the, the point of the article was it was the consistency Mm -hmm. of the behavior. And what I hear you saying is it's the consistency and the variation of the behavior that's going to keep driving testosterone into a positive uh, level. Yeah, exactly right. The adaptative response will improve as you get better at it. It's like working out. It's really hard to get in shape, but it's a lot easier to stay in shape. 
Yes. And once you're in shape, you can move between workouts much easier than day one where you're trying to figure out how to do everything. Right. So as you, that's why we use a fasting rotation. As you go through them, each one will build on itself yes. and get better. That Those numbers that you see are great, but imagine those numbers with someone who's now metabolically fit going into that, not just someone right. off the bench. Big right. difference. So you can get very efficient. You can get you can get into autophagy faster and more efficiently than those numbers and stay there longer and be able to switch it on and off easier as you go. And so if you really keep a good pattern with your efforts, you, you can also stop basing your next fast on your old results because you're you're literally a different person going into each one. Oh, pretty fascinating. Cool. Oh, so well said. I love that. Do we have a way of measuring human growth hormone? Well, I mean, not in a practical sense, but you can, if you can, you can measure insulin correlates, correlatives. And if okay. you, if you got a pretty good idea that insulin is under control and you're doing other things, you know, growth hormones, because growth hormone is pulsatile. It doesn't and, have that, and all the hormones are like that, right? Which is why I think just randomly showing up in your doctor's office and having them pull out, a, you know, a blood sample isn't always the best either. Yeah. What even you, the, the collection over time that it's given is data. That's cool. Yes, it's I starting. like data. Yeah. Don't, but be careful not to overinterpret, you know, by the numbers. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So no, but, but human, if insulin is under bay, then you uh, under control, then, you know, human growth ha has a chance and, it's, and you're doing the other things, you know, it's going pretty well and things that will change when you fast and you see the glow come out in the skin. Right. And I can look back over years on Facebook pictures and say, Oh, I was fasting there. I was, I was not fasting there, you know, or whatever it is. Oh, interesting. It's, it's very easy to see. And, and other people will start to see, they'll be like, what are you doing? You know, yeah. what's going on? And, and they don't know what it is, but they see something and they know something is because you got that, got that glow that's coming from the human growth hormone uh, reflection. Interesting. Yeah. I can tell it in my office. Like when we do our fast training weeks where we all fast together, when somebody walks in the door, I immediately can tell who's fasting and who's not based off the skin, but I didn't realize that was human growth hormone. That, yeah. That's incredible. What, how do you like to measure testosterone then? Do you like to measure it or do you think no? Okay. If they have it in their, in a program, we can look at it, but you know, a lot, the, the interpretation is the hard part. What do we do with it then? Right. It's like when they came out with all the genetic testing in the beginning, I thought that was great. You can learn all this stuff, but none of it adds up clinically, like it says on paper. And it, right. just may, it would just frustrate me and the person I'm working with. So you can, we can track it, but it's not something that I would change a whole lot in their program test by test, right? Cause right. it takes a while. They got, they had to get it, but over time it will go up. And if you're testing the sex binding, uh, sex hormone binding globulin, that'll improve. And then you look at the correlates. How is insulin going? How is it doing? And, and so forth. Because we, you know, the reality is we really have know very little about all this stuff for testing, right? you know, yeah, it's so we're doing our best. Yeah. It's, I always say it gets us in the ballpark, but you know, that's about, about it. You've mentioned a couple of times now, the sex binding uh, horm globulin hormone. What, how, tell me how we, I know we measure it in blood, but how do we make more of that? Do we want to make more? Do we want to make less? Like bring us up to speed on the importance of that. Yeah. I always mess up the order. Sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin. Yeah. So SHBG. Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that's what, when that hormone comes out, the vast majority is bound. Okay. Not to be used. And so what happens is when that number shifts, you get more out of what you have or not, what you were secreting. So even if you secrete a little bit, it can be high efficiency and that's good. That's, or at least it's, it's going the right direction. And what okay. controls the, the binding globulin is, is really insulin exposure. Ah. Uh -huh. That, it all comes down to insulin. Diagram. Yeah, it comes back. Well, it's all those things get better in a repair state and mm -hmm. growth state stops repair. Mm. So we want to be a little bit of growth, a lot of repair, a little bit of growth, a lot of repair. Repair is when autophagy, apoptosis, regeneration, and then all of that happens and mm -hmm. the, the integration of the new stem cells and so forth. And then, but, and then they get fed by the fed state, right? Mm -hmm. They get, they get boom, they get, they get the growth, but right. that's really, but we're, we promise culturally we're locked in growth all the time. Yeah. And that's, a, oh, yeah. And therefore right. there's no repair. Yeah. And you just see a lot of problems. And I could go on and on about what that does. It's just right. that's driving everything. Right. For sure. So I just interviewed uh, last week, Dr. Shauna Swan, 
Do you know what she is? Yeah. She wrote a book called Countdown. It's an amazing book. And if you right. haven't read it, you got to get it. And Put it on the list. Yeah, her whole thing is that there is one category of, of toxins that if a woman is exposed to this toxin, the first trimester of her pregnancy, the, ba the baby's testosterone will go, will lower. And when the baby's testosterone lowers, it actually changes the anatomy of the male penis based off of how much testosterone the baby is developing in the womb and how much testosterone is based off of the toxin and the toxin. You, actually, you want to make any guesses what toxin it was? Toxin, I would think BPA. Uh, Close-ish. It was just phthalates, the category of phthalate. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So all the fragrances. So she, she, her whole book is that there's lower sperm counts. We have smaller penis sizes. We have male reproduction massively changing from this one toxin. To, and you combine that with insulin resistance and you go, oh my God, how are we going to, how are we going to make it as a human species? So have you, what, tell us about toxicity and where it affects testosterone from your point of view. Well, BPA, BPA becomes a big deal because it's, it's a xenoestrogen, right? And it's just, right. it's everywhere. We can't even calculate how much we're being exposed to. And if you look at the trends, girls are getting their period sooner. Yeah. Boys are maturing later and in a different way. And it, they're, they're, that gap is, is going, growing. And so even, even the American College of, of Clinical uh, Endocrinologists, they shifted their acceptable start time for a period for girls from nine to seven what it was like 13 when we were kids it was like 13 was normal it's low end is not normal but it's acceptable and, and but they my point was is they knew this was happening and their answer was just change the change the age not figure out how to stop this or if that's a problem and then boys when they mature they're maturing later and when that happens they they mature differently you start to see much softer uh, features and edges you start to see peaks start to form in the chest uh which if if it's not that doesn't they don't grow out of that that can become actual breast tissue and you get pseudo and regular gynecomastia going and it just all these different things because of that and i think it has to do with this pool of bpa which is environmental estrogens that we're swimming in and being at a very very important time of their life especially little kids and babies because everything they have comes wrapped in plastic yeah. From the bottles to the yeah. liners to the everything to the inside of the formula can, if they use formula, I mean, just to the binky, it's just like it's all over the place. Yeah, yeah, that that's crazy. So, do you think we're on a path to human extinction? Human extinction? I don't know. That's that's a big one. I, I definitely think we're on a collision course with something. Something's going to crash hard, and there's, if you know, we're already seeing it. Just the big shift and. The development is one thing, but comes with the physical development is the mental development. Yeah. You start to see energy issues like uh, attention deficit and so on. And then that leads into depression or anxiety. And you, now you got these kids going through this and the traditional model is just to play chemistry and medicate. And now you got these teenagers in, in early college going through their life and, and starting their life and deciding they want to get off these things. Right. Yep. And they've never experienced life without them yeah there's an impact there it's like bam and so, so at some point all of that's going to come to a head if it ha if it hasn't already and and we'll, something's going to something's going to go i don't know what it you is. don't think this last year was the something that went i think it's definitely going in that direction i mean that showed us a lot uh, yeah. but i think unfortunately more can always happen right yeah more can always happen does a testosterone affect the, I know insulin affects the immune system. Does testosterone have a play a part in immune health? Uh, yeah, it does. This, well, I, what I can say is the same things that suppress testosterone suppress the immune system. So same whether they're thing, right. connected and they're both doing the same thing, I don't yeah. know. But like when we talk about eating, you eat some, eat a, some sugar, only if maybe a half a soda worth, boom, you just knock down immune system 60%. For four hours you just knock if you're a man you just knock down testosterone in a similar pattern so they, they follow that way so right you, tea, you got to figure chances are you got some immune stuff uh that's not firing well and so right right that on the radar right okay so i'm a, let's say i'm a uh 50 year old man and i'm overweight my cholesterol's high 
I'm, I'm not as motivated. I maybe don't have as much sexual drive. I definitely don't have as much energy, got some chronic pain. I'm on blood pressure medication. What, get, walk me through, like, how would we help this man? What does he need to change or look at? Because we don't know his history, but what do we, what does he need to look at to start to repair himself? Well, the good news is the basic fundamentals are pretty much the same across the, the line. All right. They start to vary when we get down the road and once we have a base. Mm -hmm. And so the base would be you control the things you can control. Right. And insulin is one of them. Insulin and, and cortisol. So food and, and stress. Yep. Right? They, they're the bullies. If insulin's a bully, cortisol is the minion. And they, you know, they, they go around and beat everybody up. And so you start with that. Cause once that's down regulated a little bit, you, your motivation will automatically go up. And then things like, cause those also control hunger, mm. cravings and emotional eating. Mm -hmm. In our programs, we, we address them first because when you don't have hunger driving you, you don't have cravings all the time and you're not emotionally eating. Suddenly now we want you to do this. No big deal. Right. You make those bigger changes. So you got to clear some of the low hanging fruit first. And okay. then and the other thing is, and the hard part working with men is they have to want it or, and see it. Yeah. So I think we as pr practitioners have to work on our language and our dialogue and culturally have to figure out a way to bridge that gap because a lot of the symptomatology of this struggle with men is still praised as the driver and the, the caregiver, not a caregiver, the bed breadwinner and the, mm. all these things like the workaholic is almost a badge of honor. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's a way that we're driving the wrong things going on for most men at all there's, you know, yeah. but for most and men don't be a man, you know, don't, don't right. cry man up, you know, all that yep. kind of stuff is creating a bigger gap for the man to, to, to feel and see that. And then and that's a problem. So I think, think, yeah, go ahead. No, do you think that's why men don't reach out for help as much? They don't go to doctors as much. They don't complain about their symptoms as much. You think, cause it's just, they've been instilled in them to culturally not do that. Well, that's part of it, but then who's going to listen? Cause most of the time, the doctor they go to is a man. Most right. of the time it's older than him. Okay. Therefore they have a little bit less of the modern thinking. And so there's a, a, a there's a disconnect, there's dissonance there. Right. There's a bias right. already there. Cause it's a very mad, you, you, I don't need to tell you and your crowd, it's a masculine based healthcare system. Yeah. Yeah. Terribly. Yeah. And so um, the injustice in that creates this hole for the guy to kind of slip through. Yeah. Kind of slip through. Yeah. And even if he says something, it doesn't get identified. And they don't identify hormone problems, never mind in depression. Right. right. If you give a guy the same hormone um, questionnaire as a woman for menopause, but take out like the sexual identifying questions like breasts and things like that, they right. score the same, if not higher. Fascinating. Interesting. And yet, if you tell a man that he's got a hormonal problem, that he's not going to hear that very That's well. It's a woman's problem. Right. Same thing with depression. That's a woman's problem. What was the first antidepressant? Was a sedative. A sedative, right? Mommy's mm -hmm. little helper. You know? Crazy. All the way back to keep them quiet. They used to look at where the word hysterectomy came from. Hysteria. Hysteria. Bad stuff. Crazy. Stuff. You know, just it's just a. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we help men? Like if, oh, if women are listening to this and they're married to a man, they're resonating with all everything you're saying, how do we help, help a man? Like, how do we, is there languaging that we can use to be more supportive and to sort of help him see it's not weak to get help for his health? That's a good question. That's where most of the attention gets put because women will see it first, right? Mm -hmm. I have a questionnaire for ir irritable male syndrome that the men can take. And I tell the women, if you got a guy in your life, you don't have to tell me, or you don't have to tell them, but do the questionnaire for them. And you'll, it'll just show you stuff. You'll be like, Oh, you'll, you'll see it's a, there's an assessment score and the things will start to come to life. Sometimes the men taking that that's enough to open up some mm, thinking self-reflection sometimes not, Yeah, you know, sometimes it is. And then just having a place you can just go and, and teaching about not goal setting, but checklists and, and, and creating the, the, the plan to make a plan, right. It just calms the system. And when you're calm, you can see things better. And you don't get that wound up thought process going out of control. Right. That's what leads us down the wrong path. I've been a victim of it. I, I was, I had it as much as anyone. I, I thought it was a great marketing tool for, to get to, 
to some more men, right? And as I'm researching and putting it together, I'm, I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm reading it. I'm like, ah, oh, that can't yeah. be true. And in, in the book, it says, if you really want to know, have your wife fill it out. I was like, oh, okay. And I went to my wife, hey, do I have this or that or this? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> and I said, what do I? And she goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I just want to know, do I do this or this and this? And she goes, I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, are you setting me up? And I, yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? And Cause it was me. I, and she thought I was somehow making a joke or setting her up, but the, that was just right out of the book. And so that's when I said, whoa. And if you really want to know if you're like that, find those questions and ask your kids. That's oh. when it really shook me up. Ooh, wow. That is, that's power. But yeah. Cause then they'll move into action when their kids tell them to do something. Oh, my wife just bugs me all the time. Anyway, yeah. you know, it's her problem, not mine. You show it to the kids and they're like, yeah, that they, they laugh and they giggle and they identify with it. You're just like, yeah. You, you know, what's so interesting is my experience with menopause was that we really needed to create more positive conversations around it and give women a platform to be able to talk about it. So we could, if we can talk about it, we can heal from it or heal from the, the craziness of it. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, like men, we could, we need to create the same space for them. And, you know, as you know, like changing things in our culture is a slow moving process, but changing things in our home may be a little bit speedier. So I, I love outside of a questionnaire, is there, is there other things that we can do? Like, is it just, are there questions we can ask our man? Are there things we can do to just invite him to, to ex be open to talking a little bit more? Yeah. You can back it up even further. Women control the household right? Making clear times, making clear, not like here's your schedule, but making things, the less ambiguity, the easier the mm -hmm. man is to follow what, to see that shit, that, that plan to make a plan, right? The right. plan is clear. You know, what drives men crazy is when you ask someone like a, a spouse, what do you, where do you want to, you want to go to dinner? Yes. Where do you want to go? I don't know. In the next hour, no one makes, you know, that just builds it up. And, and if they're already in that spot, it, it plays on their own stuff too so you can things women can do is they could just start just first awareness awareness is big and understand that it's there's some interesting books on it one's called uh, maybe he's just a jerk right you know and it's and it, but maybe he's not right the yeah, that it's moment, a great maybe title. he's not just being a jerk because one of the things that women say is like well something changed he's just not he's just not him anymore he's just he wasn't like that before and this and that kind of language you go okay I wouldn't assume that he's not that anymore, but something's getting in the way. Mm. Something shifted on him. And just, you know, that's enough to calm both sides or at least the woman. And then things you can control are, are the, the environment, how you eat in the house, mm. where you go out to dinner and, and how and where you go. That can be subtle because maybe if he's not open, he doesn't want to be manipulated or feel mm -hmm. that way. So, but you, the women have control. They can do a lot in the household, a lot and, and work on themselves. That's cool work on yourself so your resilience is higher as yeah. you enter this because that'll automatically that vibration will change him and maybe yeah. get him motivated so i mean it, it, they seem kind of esoteric but those are the kind of things you can do in the beginning once yeah. he sees a problem or if he does see a problem then you start to take bigger steps yeah because if not well helping someone who doesn't want help that we know how that goes right i mean that's that's what i don't want to see happen from this podcast is a bunch of women turn around, start nagging their husbands more. The idea is how do we open this conversation up so that men feel safe to talk about what they're feeling. And then maybe there's a, a lifestyle change that can really, like you said, many lifestyle changes that can help. So what do you, what do you think about alcohol? Where does alcohol fit into testosterone in men? Alcohol drops testosterone dramatically, immediately, immediately. immediately. It stops fat burning and so that you, now you're into a metabolic shift going on and you, right. you drops uh, testosterone immediately. And if it's in, depends on what it's in, if it's straight, that's one thing, but if it's in a beer, now you got insulin going crazy. You got, you just, everything is just whacked out pretty quickly on yeah. that. And it's a big deal. Addiction's much higher rate in men. And because we don't identify early to moderate onset of depression and problems in men is why men commit suicide. Men who are alcoholics, for example, commit suicide like 14,000% more than the average person. And wow. the reason is because th there's no, there's no identification until that point. Wow. Women will actually try to commit suicide more than men. 
Women will try more than men. They, they attempt more, but men do it more, a lot more. Because they're at, they're at this point, whereas women will act out earlier. Well, yeah. not act out, but they'll have, they'll have venues. They'll have, they have options. Because yeah. in our culture, women commune and they talk. Right. And that's accepted. And we like that, right? And we kind of say, well, men, why don't you do that? That's not their pattern. When they get the buildup, they want to they focus and they want to do something, right? But right. We, can't do something. we can't scream at that person. We can't, you know, whatever in that moment, we have to play nice. And what that does is suppress it. Right? right, suppress it, and it builds up a, a, a negative pattern, and it just it carries forward. Yeah. So part of it is figuring out how do we make the cultural norm and acceptance of, of male expression a little bit more masculine, a little yeah. bit more masculine, but not violent, but not right. something like that, and just give that because and how do we identify that earlier? Because that's terrible. It's horrible. That, that, yeah. That combination leads them to they they die. Yeah. I, you know, um, when I, again, in all the research I've done on menopause, I started to think, gosh, you know, if you look at, and I don't know the stat on this, you might, but if you look at where like the majority, what, what, what point in somebody's life that divorces happen the more commonly, I would think it's probably in a woman for a woman in her forties, because as those hormones are changing, you feel like somebody hijacked your brain. But if you take a woman going through menopause and a man who's got mismanaged testosterone, that's a really difficult combination for a successful marriage from a hormonal standpoint. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, the old men are from Mars, women are from Venus thing. They're speaking different languages. Yeah. I talk about hormones and I tell people, they're like, I want to listen to my body. I'm like, well, your body's speaking Chinese, but you speak English. You know, there's noise going on, but you don't know what you're you're talking about. And that kind of happens in that relationship. They start talking through what they're going through and they they just it just adds a little layer of more, a little more ambiguity. Right. And that's what we don't want. Ambiguity right. destroys decision. Yeah. You can't make if something's unclear, we do not make a decision. And then yeah. if we don't make a decision, it just festers. Yeah. It just festers. Crazy. And so yeah. for men, you know, it's not always about, oh, let's talk about it, this and that. Let's just if you get if men get together and they just complain about it you know if they just that's a that's a step in the right direction believe it or not mm, because there's really no there's no venue where yeah. are they going to do this other than that wow and that's the first step and so then they hear it they say it they feel it like okay it, it's that's it's one step in that plan to go forward wow wow so here's what i'm thinking don is i think you and i should start like a relationship counseling uh, consultation where we approach it from a hormonal level and we start to help couples, heterosexual couples figure out how to, and I only say that because you've got this mismatch of hormones, but how to clean up their lifestyle so they can bring their hormones back up. And then they would have a fighting chance to be able to actually work the relationship out. What oh do you think? yeah. Yeah, totally. You, you, you down, you get those hormones to just play nice. They don't have to be perfect. No, the, the edge comes off. I always love talking about the tipping point. You just drop that tipping point. That's called resilience, yeah. not management. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, if you want to count to 10 for your stress, cool. I'm not against it, but I want to build resilience. Resilience is creating a lens for ourselves that when our stress comes into our life, we're better for it, not worse. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's it. Cause we're not going to stop it. I, yeah. You know. Oh and yeah. So just I, when you get one stressor under control, another one comes around. And, exactly. and I have said for years, and I have no data on this, but I've said for years, when you look at your stress in life, about 25% of it is circumstance. About 25% of it is what you've been modeled or genetically programmed, how you react to it. But 50% of it probably is physiological. So if you, you have control over the physiological piece, clean up your diet, start yeah. fasting, all the things we talked about, your 25% of how you are modeling your behavior around stress, that's like therapy and EMDR and things like that. And then circumstances come and go. Well, it sure seems like if we fix the physiological piece, that's where we're going to have the greatest movement in our reaction to stress. Yeah. And it's a huge load off because that's something that someone else can help you with. Right. Directly. And we talk about that with food issues and with addiction. It's, it, the old thought process is that it's a willpower or it's a character flaw or you're just weak. 
they're symptoms. They are symptoms of this. They, they, we're right. expressing it. Same thing with the procrastination. You change the structure, the functional change. It will do it all. No, but it'll no. work better. Sound yeah. body. You can think clearer, sound mind. Right. Yeah. And then as it clears, then you can work on that. It just goes hand in hand, especially when someone's at that wall. I don't know what to do. Okay. Let's do this. I know right. how to, we can do this. Right. I don't know what it'll do. I know you'll be better for it. What that'll look like. I don't know, but let's do this now. Okay. Let's do it. Right. Right. So we're awesome. To. Awesome. I love this conversation. I feel like I've like been really thirsty and someone just gave me a glass of water. Oh, that's I, fantastic. That, I just, I've been wanting, because we talk so much on this platform about women's hormones and yet I don't want to leave men out of the conversation. And the more I study testosterone for women, the more intrigued I have been about what is it doing to affect men? So this was, this was brilliant. Uh, where can people find you? Easiest way to get a hold of me is through Facebook. Uh, okay. You can go to my personal page, Don Klum, and and connect with me there. I do almost all my business and and writing and stuff comes somehow through there. We have the group called um, Insulin Friendly Fasting Secrets. I recently reopened for public ad admittance, so you can go there. Uh, that's where my archives are. Article hundreds of articles and uh, the slides from the seminars I teach at yeah. and videos and everything I got. I just I put it in there. So it's a good place you can search and do your own thing, but you also yeah. got that community there. And yeah. so that, that's a good way to do it. I, I Like I started this podcast with your posts on Facebook are amazing. And I scroll through Facebook pretty quickly, but when I get to you, I'll either like screenshot it as a reminder of myself and like put it off, but I'll come back, I'll read it. You just, I don't know if it's your style of teaching, the, the conciseness in which you say stuff. It's just, it's brilliant. So we will put links in here uh, for our audience to go find you because yeah. the world needs to hear your voice more. I appreciate so, that. And I love what you're doing. I, I hear, I, we have common people all over the place and they just keep talking about you. The book club, they love you. And the book you. is going great. And I'll tell you as a man, people kind of, when I said, this is our first book for this new book club, they're like, they thought it was talking <laughs> menopause. No, it's menopause. This is, this is, for, and, and I've read a lot on it, but, and when I do, especially from a medical or health practitioner side, it also, it comes off as jaded. Like this is not really for you, men. You know, like uh -huh. you're not going to get it, but you could read it if you want. Yours was open and it was, it was a dialogue and I felt included and I got, I feel more confident even talking about it after yeah. reading that than I have. And, I, and again, like I said, I've read a bunch of them, but there's a disconnect and yours was very inviting. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's really what I wanted to do was open the conversation because I felt like when I went searching for answers. I, you know, I just, there was no conversation to be had, or it was here, take this pill, all your symptoms will go away. And, you know, the way you and I have been trained, we know the power of the body. And when the body's not functioning normally, there's some interference somewhere. And that I just wanted to open the conversation up. And so I'm so happy for, I, I actually haven't heard a male's perspective like that. So I really appreciate that. That was awesome. Appreciate yeah, it. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, I have five questions, rapid fire questions yeah. for you, and they're unique for you. Um, okay, you're you're sitting in front uh, in a classroom in front of twenty teenage boys, and you want to teach them about testosterone and keeping themselves hormonally healthy. What what do you tell them? What do you tell them about that? Yeah. Um, that you know, the, the, the overwhelm and the confusion that you feel about this thing is, is about testosterone and, and, the, and the surge. We need to focus that you focus that and you can get beyond that. Cause that's what they, when I go to speak or do a poll, that's what they're all about. Confusion, overwhelm, flooded full of feeling. Right. And so it's all about, Hey, we can get past that. Let's do that. Okay. Hard and now, say. okay. And now the second question is you're sitting in front of, um, a group of 55 year old men and their energy is low. They're out of shape. They're not feeling good. And they want to know lifestyle wise. There's like, if you were to give them two or three things that they could do lifestyle wise, what would you recommend? First thing would be frequency, meal frequency. Just go to three meals a day. I won't take any of your food away. I won't take the junk you're doing fine. Just put it in three meals, simple as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No magic times in between, no magic space, three meals a day, all your food. That's number one. Number okay. two, walk. Take multiple small walks a day. 
It's amazing what it does to insulin, cortisol, and other hormones. The way it, 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 no hands in pockets, no sunglasses, no talking on the phone, no earbuds. You're just and it, you're not taking your pulse. You're not changing your clothes. You're not going to sweat. You just go for a five to eight minute walk, and okay. do it five to eight times a day. Oh, I love minutes. that. Yeah. Walking, walking keeps showing up in the research I'm doing just on brain health and as just this key activity that we need to be doing. And I think well, sometimes we're like sitting or we're on, we're working out, but are we, when do we just go walk? When our brain is focused and especially in stress or anything else like this, it's in a certain mode. When we walk, no hands in pockets, because we got to swing our arms. That'll oh. turn on the intrinsic motor system. Have you ever taken a long hike and stop for to, to chat? You'll feel your legs and butt kind of tick, 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 tick. They're still firing because right. you had you activated that, right? right? Same thing. When that turns on, it takes two to three minutes. Then that part of your brain goes like this. Opens up. Yeah. And motivation and creativity starts to flood. And that's why people say when they were out in the woods or on a, a hike or exercising when they had their epiphany or their great idea. Same right. thing. We need to, and that's a start, stop, start concept. Like I mentioned earlier, we want to, that's why we do it multiple times a day, not one 40 minute walk, but a bunch of little ones to get that right. going, get that going and prime that and get that into our system. Wow. Wow. Well said. Okay. What about books? What books, if a man wants to read more about testosterone, do you have some books that you were like, yes, you talked about the irritable male syndrome. Is that, was that from a book or did you come up with that? Nope. That's right here, actually. Oh, it's an actual, oh, look, the irritable yeah. male syndrome. Okay. This is my, I got all, there's all sorts of them for men. If you're willing to Unmasking male depression. I love it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Oh my God. Look at all these. Science -y. If you're science, do you get in the male brain? The male brain. Oh my gosh. And this one is more for fun and women will dig it, but and I won't say the name, but you'll get it. Oh, you, we can say it. You want to say it? Nope. <laughs> I'll tell everybody it's uh, called, I used to be a miserable fuck. <laughs> now we're going to have to put a sensor on this. Mr. Mean is the next one. Oh my gosh. These are great. Oh my gosh. Manopause. I love it. Yeah. I'm working on, I'm doing a program for irritable male syndrome, hormonal man. And so it's, they're all top of mind and they're, you know, and there's more, there's a lot, yeah. there's not as many as women's hormones, but they're, they're, they're pretty insightful, some of them. That, okay, well, we're going to list all those books out in the notes. That, that was amazing. Um, okay, what? I'm only going to give you one thing on this one. I, I've just been deeply thinking about the health of the world over the last year. You know, a lot of people approach the pandemic from a lot of different angles, but I've been walking around going, why is everybody so immune compromised? What the heck is going on? What do you, if there was one thing you would have everybody on the face of the planet change lifestyle wise to boost their health and specifically their immune system, what would it be? I would work on their sleep. Ah, okay. Sleep and is, is the unsung hero. If you're not, all those hormones we talk about and when they will heal, it happens when we're sleeping. Yep. What yeah. we do during the day sets the stage. Right. And then at night, the play un unfolds. If we don't do, if we don't, we can do everything right in the day, but if we're not sleeping, the play never happens. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's well when we burn fat, we build muscle, we reset, we detoxify, all that's happening when we're sleeping. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's what I would focus on. If we can get some quality sleep, then we have a fighting chance. Yeah. Ah, oh, I love that. Okay. Last question. If you had one message for the world that you could get in everybody's brain and, and they'll never forget it, what would that message be? What would that message be? You already have what you want. You already have the ability. It's in you. We don't need to help it. We need to get out of the way. Yes. You know, healing, health needs no help, just no interference.